We're about to see something that is possible because of technological advances, the dramatic openness of global data now from satellites, the ability to have very high-powered computers with sophisticated algorithms that take these billions of data points and turn them into something really useful so that every single person in the world on their smartphone, as long as they have internet access, will be able to see everything that Matt is going to show us. So far, people in more than 200 countries. We've only found one country where this has not actually been used yet for policy purposes. And that's North Korea, and we're working on it so that we have the entire world covered. The use of land for economic activity is a big deal globally with burgeoning populations, higher consumption rates. So when you look at this pattern right here, you can see in this 14-year period, green being trees remaining as trees, red is loss, and blue is gain. Magenta is where we have both loss and gain. Another climate change signal that we see in forest loss, forest disturbance, is this big hazy mess in British Columbia. So this is an endemic bug in the forests of British Columbia that has gotten the upper hand on forest and defoliation because minimum winter temperatures are not as cold as they used to be. We have in, our, in the United States the Corn Belt. I grew up in Indiana. It was at one time 90% hardwood forest. It was cleared for big row crops, and now it's just corn and soybean. This is what's going on in Brazil and Argentina. They're cleaning their, clearing their forests to do big ag. Here, we paid farmers to not farm anymore because the soils were poor. They were on slopes, and we, we paid them to plant trees. And this is what, we, what I like to call the tree belt. We've turned all of this land into commercial forestry. I'm going to go back to the forest loss gain mix, and when I zoom in here, these colors represent red is loss, blue is gain, magenta is both. So this just re represents a churning of the landscape as pulp is processed for pulp and paper and timber products. The best wood for that is hardwood forests. Those come out of wetland bottomland forests in the southeast, and the question of sustainability is raised because the hardwood forest takes 70, 80 years to come back in this context. So we have this, we have this question of you know, sustainability impacts on biodiversity, habitat. Let's take a look at Eurasia. This is IKEA from space. That's a long-held traditional land use of forestry. And, it's, and when you look at the land tenure, it's very fine grain. Um, these are, this is a, a very old, established land use. And there are, you know, the, the protected areas in this, in this area are not huge, but they are intact and, 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 and uh, well, well respected. Here's the Russian border. You can see it from space here in terms of the dynamic of forestry. The forests on the Russian side are older. Some of these are old growth. This is a buffer that was established by the Soviets. But with the change in Soviet to Russian post-Soviet rule, we see a forest regrowth where collectivized farms were abandoned. We see in the color pattern here, yellow to red, as they log the forest closer and closer to the Finnish border. As we go down into the tropics, we can look at a place like Central America. And this is like the polygonization of, of remnant forests. So this is the Mayan Biosphere Reserve. You can see all of the fo forest change ringing this, this kind of tri-national reserve, including Guatemala, Belize, and Mexico. And we can see that the, uh, the difference in exploitation on different sides of the border, a lot of the Guatemalan side is the changes inside national parks. Laguna del Tigre is a national park in the northwest of Guatemala that's being clear cut. 50% of tropical deforestation occurs in Brazil. If you look at these colors in Brazil, the dominant color here is yellow, and yellow is in the early 2000s. Brazil leads the world in monitoring with satellite data. They, they have an operational system, they deliver the data on time, and they report on what's going on in the, in the Amazon forest. Since 2006, their rate of deforestation has been going down. This is a result of forest codes and the combination of civil society, private industry, and government coming together to move deforestation out of the Amazon. And their space agency, INPE, produces this product analogous to what we have here. And this is the de facto proof of the success of the policy. They've cut deforestation by 70, 80 percent. This tool enables us to at least get the baseline of what these trends are and then to inform policy so that policy can, can pick the way, choose the way forward to, to balance both economic development with ecosystem service provision. Even though Brazil did this fantastic job of slowing deforestation, places like Vietnam, Cambodia, Bolivia, Tanzania, their rates are increasing to such a point that they drown out the Brazil signal. We need to highlight Brazil. It stands alone as a really important example of balancing the ecosystem services valuing of intact forests. 
against uh, the, their appropriation for economic development. As we go to Central Africa, and DR Congo is a special case. We have 80 million people. It has a somewhat stateless situation. They don't bring in food aid in any, any large amounts. They don't have oil to trade for cheap foodstuffs. They feed themselves. So it's 80 million people carving out new, for, new land to do rotational small, smallholder agriculture. And you see it, that's the pressure. And the question is, you know, when the satellite, how frequently are they revisiting the same plot? Eight to 10 years, it should be 18 to 20 years. Health indicators correlate very well with the lack of forest and this intense kind of population density. And we've had people do studies in Malawi re relating dietary outcomes to degraded lands and lack of tree cover. You see some really big agro-industrial change. This is new to Central Africa and it's worth watching as, as our, our hunger for palm oil continues. Moving over to Southeast Asia, it's very similar to Latin America. It's uh, industrial scale clearing of forests palm oil, rubber, and uh, we see, when I put on protected areas, we'll see in a place like Cambodia, a lot of clearing and loss of, 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 of force within protected areas. So again, like Guatemala, we have a lot of hot spots that represent the, the you know, compromised integrity of protected area networks. To understand the scale of change is, is really valuable, I think, to, to get a global perspective. Um, and then to, to understand that we can drill down to find scales and understand what's happening locally. You can see exactly what happens in almost real time. And this has a lot of implications. So when President Yudiono saw this, he said, for the first time, I actually know what is really happening in the forests of Kalimantan. So that's a sort of a government sort of uh, a situation. And the reason that Brazil is, one of the reasons it's been effective is that it's used this kind of data. And of course, then you know where to go and apply your uh, special efforts to protect against encroachment, so to speak. But even more dramatic now is the way the private sector is using this material. Major players in the palm oil industry, all the way from the planters and the plantation owners, all the way through the processors, the Unilevers, all the way through then those who actually sell it in the shops, they came together and they said, we are going to commit to deforestation-free supply chains. Now, that kind of commitment's very nice, but in the old days, extremely difficult to know. <laughs> either, either the company itself, whether it's being honored, um, but certainly for the consumers. But we can not only put the, the protected areas, we can put every palm oil concession on there, and you can see precisely those that are encroaching outside their, their concessions. You know exactly who they are. The truth of the matter is, the bad guys can't hide anymore and the good guys can be rewarded. And so throughout the supply chain, you can start to see real differences. So With these type of data, we have a democratization of information. We can evaluate policy success or failure. We can evaluate government responsiveness or not. So I think it's really powerful as a global public good to allow a, a plethora of users get in and do long-term monitoring.